hello, my name is Joanne Hayek. Today I'll be presenting uh, my paper. It's a testimonial paper in which I will be sharing case studies of my work. I'll take you through the methodology. Uh, some, so from waste to luxury, fashion as catalyst for sustainable development. So just before we start, maybe a bit of background about, about myself. Uh, I'm a social entrepreneur and researcher. Uh, I'm initially an architect, but I ventured into fashion quite early on and co-founded my company, Palina, with Tatiana Fayal. It's based in Beirut. It was founded in 2007. And in parallel to that, I'm involved in academia. I, I teach. I was teaching previously in Beirut at the American University of Beirut. And currently, I'm an assistant professor in Dubai at the Dubai Institute of Design and Innovation. Um, so uh, for, for this paper, I will be talking about some projects that we have explored through the through Vanina, which is a social enterprise that has grew organically in Beirut. And through through the years, we have been exploring fashion as a tool for social and environmental development through different collections that deal with material transformation as well as craft the development of craftsmanship. Um, so the paper is based on case studies of collection through which we extract. I try to extract findings about what could be the methodologies to use fashion as a catalyst of social and environmental development, particularly interested in <clears throat> the transformation of waste to luxury. So from left to right, the five case studies. The first, uh, Delicatez, it's a collection of evening bags that we created and that was launched with um, Net-A-Porter with their platform Net-Sustain. Uh, it, proposes to transform non-recyclable food packets into uh, evening bags, so luxury pieces of fashion. The second one <coughs> conserved is also based on upcycling uh, food waste, of uh, food uh, packaging, in this case, tin cans. And particularly here, it focuses on community development. So we work with NGOs for the development of, of livelihoods of communities um, in need, in particular, in this case, refugee camps in rural areas of Lebanon. And then the third in the middle that we see here is um, called leaves. It's um, a transformation of um, used paper into jewelry, and it's uh, making use of digital fabrication. And I'll be talking about each of them more uh, in the next slides, but just to introduce briefly before we start. Then the fourth is the is, uh, is Eternel, transforming um, discarded plastic into a new material that we that we developed and created a series of evening bags with. And the fourth, the light of Beirut, which was created at the wake of the blast of Beirut, using uh, the remains, the, the shattered glass that was there. It was more of a tribute collection that was not commercialized, but uh, using fashion as a way to send a message and pay tribute to the city. Okay, so without further ado, I'll take you through each of the collections and what each one can tell us. So the first one, Delicatesse, which is transforming non-recyclable food packets. Initially, it was inspired by an exploration that we were doing uh, using non-biodegradable non plastic bags that we were transforming into luxury. It was a collaboration with Swarovski. And through that, we, through this process of transformation, we came across the particular uh, food packets that are made of plastic, particularly like chips bags and chocolate packets, you know. And it turns out that they're not recyclable or they're very, very difficult to recycle because of the <clears throat> mix of two different materials, the plastic and the aluminum inside. So we realized that since it's so costly to separate, it ends up being going to a landfill. So we realized that in fact, through fashion, we have the possibility to give that an actor life, but also to raise awareness about the potential and the value hidden in this material that we see every day, but we don't necessarily pay attention to. <clears throat> and so the transformation process mixes um, uh, digital fabrication and parametric design to enable a zero waste transformation. So in order to use the entirety of the variety of bags, and also, and this is, so we see here on the right, the laser cutting uh, pattern, and then this is followed by handcraft. So it's assembled by hand uh, meticulously by women that we have met and that we train in the craft of making. 
And so this collection of jewelry has evolved later because we realized the potential, but we wanted to increase the volume and we wanted to take this material even further. So it evolved to this series of bags, a similar technique using um, a system of origami, hand woven origami that we, we developed <coughs> that is uh, following the digital fabrication and the digital design. And so it borrowed from our architectural tools um, that we use in, in architecture to simulate, to design, and to compute uh, the files, but then it's followed by uh, traditional handcrafts such as sewing and pleating as well. And, and this was enabled also through our, so we are based in Beirut, the whole uh, fabrication uh, or manufacturing network is in Beirut, it's decentralized. But we, we also export, so we rely a lot on our collaboration with um, luxury uh, platforms and resellers around the world. Particularly, this collection was launched exclusively with meta and uh, through their new plat at the time, it was a new platform that they were launching in 2019 called Net Sustain, so uh, focusing on sustainable products and sustainable brands as well. And so the mixing of the digital fabrication and parametric design with traditional handcraft allowed us to transform this material into a series of vision bags. And as you can see from the outside, we don't necessarily, and this is a choice we make across the collection, we don't necessarily say, or the, the product doesn't hint at the fact that it's upcycled or that it's coming from weight. It is quite luxury. We mix it in this case with gold-plated brass as well to elevate it. But the inside reveals what it's made of and this is the story of the product and in a way it raises awareness about issues of every day so issues in this case the waste generated by the food industry but also the, the problematics behind um, processed food and everything that comes uh, with it so moving to our second case study conserved so that was uh, created prior to the ICATES. it was a line that we uh, developed out of um, in, in collaboration with two NGOs, one focusing on waste management in Lebanon. So it was a way to uh, support waste management um, projects in Lebanon, as well as the other who, who was working in rural areas of Lebanon, in which we had uh, refugee camps um, that were, you know, communities in need of finding livelihoods and, and jobs and, and that. So we created workshops to train women and men that had no prior experience in, in making and to transform the, the, the tin cans into a series of jewelry and, and handbags. And the transformation process, as you can see, is zero waste. So we could use the entirety of, of the piece itself and turn it into, uh, into a, a piece. So here, we can see a snapshot, I'll pass through it quickly, but it's in the rural area of Lebanon. And so the model of Anina is decentralized. Uh, so it's, we, we didn't grow vertically, we grew through partnerships with different either NGOs or communities or also micro enterprises that allowed us to decentralize uh, the work and, and, and the manufacturing. And then moving to the third one where we can see like, the, the fa in fact, it's what we do is in a way go back in tradition and try to revive the crafts. And in the previous case, we saw you know the making and the weaving, but also look into the future and innovative technologies, particularly in this case, 3D printing. So we teamed up uh, with a European company, Encore, which was developing a sustainable 3D printing technique to transform a paper into a wood-like material. And with them, we pushed the, this further and tried to, and used used paper, so recycling paper or upcycling paper into a wood-like texture that then we turned into through painting and you know hand assembly into uh, uh, jewelry in this case. And so, and this is also done uh, enabled through our cross-disciplinary approach. So the fact that me and my co-founder, both designers. At the, initially did not come from the fashion background. We each came from a, an adjacent field, in my case, architecture, in her case, marketing. It allowed us to rethink, like not approach it like the traditional methods of designing fashion, but rethinking uh, the, the methods, and in this case, borrowing from architectural uh, techniques for that. 
And so for us, R&D and innovation in-house is important. So moving to the fourth example, or the fourth case study um, with Les Eternels, it's a collection that emerged after several years of experimentation about how to transform plastic waste and variety of different plastic waste into a new texture that is that varies between marble-like texture to shell-like texture, um, and what you see, so different, different uh, patterns and texture that we were able to create out of because it was uh, created in-house. And so it's, it's a transformation, it's a recycling process that is relying on handcraft and that we, we have co-developed with our artisans. Um, and so each of the bags is unique uh, because they are handmade and in, in a way they give an afterlife to this everyday waste that we have in a way to say that in fact it's it's really precious and we should cherish it instead of you know just wasting it uh, eternally so um, also thinking of the renewability of the resources that we consume and and raising awareness to that so as much as the the work aims to to really impact in terms of um, providing an afterlife to problematic waste. It's also mainly focusing on raising awareness and sending a message through fashion because we believe fashion in many cases is a cultural um, form of art as well and so has a, has a role to play in, in the discourse itself. Which brings me to, my, uh, to our last case study, The Light of Beirut, which was um, it was a form of, if you want, personal catharsis as well, because we all, all the team and myself and my colleagues went through a very difficult episode with the blast of Beirut that shattered our city, our atelier, our houses, etc. And uh, we, in a way, tried to heal personally through what we love to do and through fashion, because we, we have always been transforming materials into into luxury, and in this case, we were surrounded by the glass shattered by the by the explosion, and it was for us a way to pay tribute to the beauty of the city. So the, the pieces are inspired by some of the architectural features of the city. We decided not to commercialize it because of the sensitivity of the topic and the fact that there is a trauma. There was a trauma in Beirut, um, so it's more of a tribute piece than really a product that you want to consume. Um, but it was it was developed and it was uh, we created the pieces and, and along with artisans. So the whole process of making and innovating and testing and designing was in itself a healing process for us and for the team and for our artisans uh, as well. So here we can see some of them. And yeah, I'll uh, just to maybe uh, summarize or to uh, from from these case studies, we can see that uh, well, they are different in approaches. At the same time, they all share the fact that they are based on material remediation. And so, I try to extract from them methodologies that could enable the use of fashion as a tool for social and environmental impact. One, uh, the, the the first, in my opinion, is the fact that it's built based on a social entrepreneurship model. So the fact that when now was since the beginning established as a social enterprise that prioritizes pro, um, impact over profit, enabled you know, to invest in R&D for sustainable material uh, development, innovation, and remediation. And then uh, this allows to offer alternative to non-recyclable waste, for example, like we saw in the case of the ICATES. And then um, relying on some innovations or in a, um, emerging technologies like algorithmic design or digital fabrication enables the uh, zero waste transformation, as well as the revival of crafts that are, you know, disappearing as we see, uh, and that we believe are extremely valuable for the livelihood that they support. So reviving traditional crafts through digital fabrication. Uh, which promotes also the valorization of craftsmanship through luxury. And so, so that we start to better appreciate, you know, the time spent behind the piece and the hands that have gone through it. And every piece of, of Anina comes with a, with a message and uh, the name of the artisan and the date at which it was made so that we really also show the, the story behind it and the person behind it as well. And so it's, it's in a way, a way to send 
a message because fashion travels and fashion stays with, with, with time and can carry a message. So for us, that's quite important as well. And another point that um, is, is key and that I practice also through academia, particularly now at the Dubai Institute of Design and Innovation, where I teach, is the cross-disciplinarity. So merging fashion with another discipline, um, like what we do at, at, at the IDI is we have fashion design, but we also have product design, multimedia design, and strategic design management. And the students each choose two cross concentrations that they merge. That allows them to innovate further and to push the limits of, of the discipline, which personally I have experienced and I felt was, was uh, also helping to push sustainability further. Um, and then collaboration with NGOs in our case was is key because, um, you know, it's a win-win because they would they they need to create jobs, but we also need to know who are the communities in need or what are the challenges that are currently faced, so that fashion can become a tool to catalyze or to push the development further. And finally, um, it is local, and we believe in local development. At the same time, in some cases, like in the case of Beirut economy, it is not enough to impact. So the, the link, the local aspect of it, and the link to the international scene in our case was instrumental to so let fashion really become a tool of local development. So yeah, um, that's in a nutshell <laughs> where uh, like the findings that I, I could extract from the case studies. And yeah, here is are some of, not all of the people who are involved in the different projects, uh, my co-founder, the team, uh, and also the artisans, I'm citing just a few of those particularly involved in these projects, but we work currently with 70 uh, artisans uh, through Vanina across Lebanon. Yeah, and thank you so much uh, for listening. I look forward to discussing that with you and hearing your comments, if any. Thank you.